Good morning, everybody. Um, we are moving on to a new chapter in our textbook. This is the textbook. We're moving on to chapter 10. Probably can't see that, but you can see the screen, and you can see this is a Muroc textbook. Uh, chapter 10 is basically uh, something that we could have covered at various points in this in this class. Uh, it's more GUI graphical controls, um, and so you know we've worked with forms basically all semester, and we've worked with buttons and text boxes. That's really about it. Maybe a couple times we've worked with like a radio button or a checkbox, but uh, for the most part, we've been keeping the the GUI simple. And, and we're really not making them too much more complex. If you look at, you know, the ob objectives here, there's there's about five new controls that we introduce. And and again, some of them we've been through before. So uh, I my hope is that, uh, you know, there's, there's more code intensive chapters. And it's not that we're not writing code. We're still writing code. Uh, but my hope is that the learning curve is not as steep for this chapter as maybe chapter 12 when we learn classes and objects and then you know chapter 13 and 14 and 15 we learned inheritance and interfaces and all these brand new concepts um, these concepts are really just in addition to the the concepts that we've already come across with the forms um, so if you look at the knowledge there on slide two you know, we're looking at um, some new controls like a combo box, a list box, radio button, check box, and group box. I mean, those really aren't overly complex controls. We'll, we'll talk about those here in a little bit. Um, and then, of course, we got some refactoring. They always throw in some refactoring and how to, you know, hey, we, we, go, we went ahead and created this control, and now we want to rename it to something else. So that's what they mean by refactoring. Um, there is a file that maybe you've stumbled across, and the, the file is called program.cs, and you really, we haven't touched programs.cs, but we'll, we'll explore that today. What, what can we do in that file? What can that do for us? And so objective number three talks about the, the program class. So that's what I'm talking about there. Um, we are going to start working with multiple forms. So right now everything we've done is on one form, but if you've ever stopped to think about it, most applications have more than one form, one set of controls on multiple forms. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, we get introduced to one technique that's probably, in my opinion, um, one of the easier techniques. Um, but it's very useful, and so we're going to um, have multiple GUI forms. By the way, for those of you that are listening live, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, little choppy on the stream. Um, we're all working from home, and everyone's quarantined right now because of this virus. Um, so my understanding is that internet providers, be it, you know, whoever you have for your internet provider, they're kind of struggling to deal with all the new internet traffic from everyone being home and working from home and things of that nature. Um, so my, I apologize for those of you listening live. Hopefully, hopefully the recorded stream is a little bit better quality. Um, it's something I think that's out of my control. Uh, I have my home internet that's really, from from what I've, from the past couple of years, I've really never had any problems. I've got a nice high-end router. I've got a nice high-end service. Um, so I've really never had issues up until this point, but um, that's kind of been failing me. So I switched over to my cell phone, believe it or not, and I'm using a hotspot from my cell phone. Um, which seems to be better. So hopefully that works for everybody. 
Um, and uh, getting back to the objectives here, when we when we're looking at number four, uh, we're going to learn how to respond to multiple forms. Basically, we're going to send data back and forth between these forms. Again, you got you got the first form, you got the second form. The second form is going to do something. If we want to take information from the second form and send it back to the first form, how can we do that? And um, you know, how can we respond to certain events like, hey, you're trying to close this form. What do we need to do um, before you do that? That's that's objective number five, the form closing event. Um, so looking at slide number four here, you know, again, some of these controls. Uh, pretty, pretty self-evident what they are, but I'm going to cover them like we've never discussed them before. So, um, again, so if we look at objective number one here, uh, we've got a combo box, and on the screen here, the combo box is what I would call a drop-down list, and it's when you look at the expiration date. Um, those are your two right next to the expiration dates, combo boxes. Uh, you would prefix them with CBO in the, uh, the name of the control. Now, the, the look of that combo box is not the default look. In fact, if I open up uh, Visual Studio here real quick, uh, create a new dummy project real quick. Um, so what I'm getting at is you're going to have to change a property because by default, a combo box lets an end user type something in, which is kind of strange. Um, if you ask me, most of the times I think of a drop-down list, you're not letting users type into that, but that is the default behavior. So again, we got these combo boxes. Um, you'll notice that to fill the combo box, you can use the GUI. And you can add items, one per line here. Uh, I'm not going to recommend, I mean, you could do this, and, and it would work just fine. However, in the real world, probably what you're doing many times is you're, you're loading information in dynamically into this list. And so if you put something in here like, uh, like maybe the states, right, Illinois and Missouri, if you put something into that, uh, that's kind of a static list. And that's that's fine um, for some cases. That's going to be just fine. But also, we're going to learn to kind of dynamically at runtime populate these lists, so that you know that's uh, you know for example, here's a real world scenario that I've done. So it's like um, you know at Rankin, I, I made an application where teachers um, could can submit referrals for their students to get help for their students if maybe they've got some issues outside of school or some academic issues they need help with. And, uh, you know, I don't, when, when, when a form would load, I would only want the classes that that teacher would teach to be seen in a drop-down list, right? So if I'm only teaching two classes, I should only see my two classes here. Right, so that's very dynamic in nature. If I log in, I see my classes. If another teacher logged in, uh, he or she would see her classes. And so that's not a static list of, of classes that's going to be the same way every time. It's a very dynamic thing. So we're going to learn to do that. Getting back to the original discussion here is this does allow someone to type in, uh, you know, another state. And if there are other controls, I could take focus off of that. And that would be an acceptable value. So um, by default, this combo box allows users to type something in. Uh, to change that real quick, you go into properties and you have to change its uh, mode. And uh, da, 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 da. it's not the draw mode. Let me find this. It always takes me a minute to find. There's a thousand properties here. Um,
course, I haven't done this in a while either, so... Drop down style is what someone chimed in. Of course, I'm blind. So drop down width, drop down height. Under what? Is it under behavior, design? I'm blind to the bat. If I look in the fridge for something, I'm never going to find it. Like, it's going to be right in my face. Under appearance, thank you. Drop down style. Hey. Hey. <laughs> there we go. Now we don't, now this drop down list is not, uh, does not allow someone to type in here. Right. Again, I'm blind as a bat. Sometimes it takes me a minute, but we found it. There it is. Um, so let's talk about this particular control and its advantages. Uh, obviously, um, you know, if you had to list all 50 states there, it's not going to take up much room. Uh, so you could, you know, expand and see your options. You select your option. Um, you're only going to allow the user to select one thing. So again, just kind of thinking of some advantages of this control. Number one, if you want the user to select from a list or type something in, right, you do have that option right N no other controls here have that option you you can select from a list or let them type that in so that's one benefit it takes up less space on on the form so that's a benefit um and um those are the only two that are coming to mind right so moving on uh we've got uh, radio buttons and these radio buttons you know, obviously what they allow you to do is just to select one amongst a group. And so very commonly, you put radio buttons inside of a container control uh, that we're going to talk about here. Going back to the objectives, we've got this group box. And so if you don't put radio buttons in a group box, you just put them on the form, then that's the container for all the radio buttons so all the radio buttons that just go directly onto the form they are by default in a group right but if you if you don't want that if you want them to be in their own group you can add a group box and so a group box is just a container of course you you come over to your your toolbox and you go under containers you add in a group box and then you can add controls into that uh, the radio buttons here and just by adding them into the same group box, they're going to be in, they're going to be grouped, right? So you could only select one of these options, and so I believe you would say that's mutually exclusive, right? Only only one at a time. Uh, and what I said before is if you just drag them directly onto the form, then these are in their own group, and these are in their own group. Uh, it doesn't matter where you put them. There's it's just the default behavior. You could you could put them over here. And you think, oh, well, that's not going to be in conjunction with that, but in fact, it should be. Right? So that's just the nature of how, of how that works. Um, now, you know, if I wanted to get radio button 5 into my group box, you know, it's not dragging group box onto radio button 5, but it's vice versa, right? you got to take radio button 5 and drag it into the group box. And then when you move the group box around, it moves all the controls within it automatically. Um, so that's your group box, that's your radio button, and then your checkbox. The idea is that they don't have to be, you know, mutually exclusive. You could just check as many as you want, and this would be, you know, for things like this, it would be like, uh, you know, uh, you know, pick your gender. At the end of the day, when you check one gender, it unchecks the other. Uh, check boxes would be, you know, something like, oh, you know, select all the magazines that you want to subscribe to. And you let the user check as, as many things as you want. And so... I don't know how to respond to that, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Uh, so those are one, two, three, four. The only thing we have left out is a list box. And a list box, 
as you see the credit card type. The, the, the thing that's different about a list box is it, it can allow you to select multiple items. And so there's a mode on the list box. Um, let's you can edit items. You can use this little smart tag, and you can edit items here. Again, I'm going to show you how to dynamically load these up. But uh, what you'll notice is there is a collection, right? There's an items collection, which it's an important word because we've studied collections before and how to add items to collections and things of that nature. Uh, And the selection mode is one multi-simple or multi-extended. So obviously one, you're only selected one. Multi-simple, let's check multi-simple. And what I'm going to do is hold down the control. And you see you can select multiple there versus multi-extended multi-extended see I just oh here we go check the thing go to properties multi-extended uh, should be concurrent so it multi extended versus mul well it's looking the same way um, let me hit the text textbook real quick one of these should only allow you to select items concurrently versus one would let you uh, select items that weren't concurrent but by holding down control visually anyways it looked like they were behaving the same but the uh, the theory anyways and I don't know if I actually tried to do something with that if, if they would both work I think the idea is that one only allows you to select concurrent, one right after the other, and the other allows you to kind of jump around. Let me double check myself. I always, uh, give me one second. I just read this the other night, but uh forgot the difference between the two already. There it is. Thank you for pointing that out again. If you know that you're going to have a hard time finding it, you, you'll have a hard time finding it. It's like you predestined to struggle. Uh, if you set it to multi-simple, the user can select multiple entries by clicking on them. If you set, set it to multi-extended, the user can hold down control and shift keys to select non-adjacent items. So multi-extended is the one that allows you to select non-adjacent items. If you select multi-simple, uh, it says you can s only select multiple entries by clicking on them. So again, in practice, I didn't really see the difference, but in theory, that's that's the, the concept. So let me click here. Let me pin my properties. So help. Let me not hold down control. Okay, see, I'm not holding down control. And so multi-simple just allows you to click. Again, not holding down control. That's, that's the difference that I missed the first example through. Um, if I change that to multi-extended, now I'm not holding down control 
and the only way to select multiple is to hold down control. So, okay, small difference whether you're holding the keyboard or not, that appears to be the difference, and it does not have to do with the adjacent like, uh, like I thought it did. So, good thing that we found that. Okay, selecting multiple in a uh, list control, selecting one or the other in a radio button, combo box. Of course, we got a normal text box, nothing new there, and a checkbox. So those are our new controls. Now, there are some differences um, between all these controls, but because of inheritance, right, all of these, many of these controls um, have the same properties, right? So it, when you're looking at here, if we're looking at a list box and a combo box, so list box and combo box share a lot of the same properties uh, and events because they're inherited uh, in the same chain of, of inheritance. And so some of the properties that are, are commonly used, okay, we have selected index. So the idea here, if we look at our list box, uh, the index is just the position that they're in. So 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Everything starts off at 0. So the number 1 would actually be index 0, and so on and so forth. So that's the index. Selected item, okay? The item actually returns an object. And so if we had, you know, objects, let's just say student, student one, student two, student three, student four, and we had four students that were visible in that box, um, and we selected one, and we wanted to return the object as a whole, not just a number, not just a name, but we wanted to return the whole object, that's where we would use the selected item property. We have the text property. The text property is what the user sees. So we could have a whole student object on display, and we'll do this in a lab, where we, we have objects that are selectable in a list, but then what the user actually sees might be the, the student's last name. You might just see last names or student IDs. You know, the text property is what the user sees. Uh, we have an items collection, which is what you saw uh, as way to add items through the items collection, and we're going to be using that quite a bit. So I will tell you these are all common. Selected index, that's common. Selected item, common. Text, that's common. Um, not so much sorted, but definitely use the items collection a lot. Oh, there we go. S drop down style and selection mode. Those were the properties that I've already demonstrated to change the combo box and the list box as far as how you work with them. When you change, so some common events, selected index changed. So let's take a look at our default uh, for a radio button. Notice the default event, when I say the default, I'm talking about the default event. If I double-click radio button 1, we get check changed. So that's the default event. Remember, there are multiple events for each control. If I go under the, the properties and I click the lightning bolt, I see these are all the different events that you could use for a radio button. But it has to have one default. So when you double-click it, it creates the default event handler. Now, what's important to remember about this check changed is that this check changed event will run when a radio button goes from unclicked to clicked, which makes sense, but it also goes when it goes from clicked to unclicked. So basically true to false or false to true. Um, it runs at both of those, at both of those times. And so that's just something to keep in mind. The default handler for a list box is selected index change. So that means the user selected a different item in the list. Um, anytime that changed, you would run 
this handler. Again, these are just the default handlers because they're the most common events. Um, so those are what we're going to use the majority of the time, if not all of the time, uh, in this class, realizing there are different events. Text changed, well, that would be that would be on the uh, like on the text box. You just got to be you got to be uh, aware that on a text box, you know, obviously, any time the text changed, any time a user types a letter or deletes a letter, one letter at a time, it's going to continually fire this event, right? So any time the text box changes character by character, th you know, if you type in the word the, T-H-E, this text change will run three times, each time for one letter. So that's a frequently firing event. Now, I mentioned that there is an items collection on our list box. And uh, we want to use this dynamically, right? So we want to add items to a list dynamically instead of statically, I'm going to delete this event, instead of statically adding items to the collection here, okay, the example that you could use is when the form loads, you read something out of a database. And and load the data into the list. So it's always good practice anytime that you add a control, obviously, to name it. I did not do that. List example. And so, again, we're going to use the constructor to assign values into the items collection of our list. So we do list example items collection dot and these are our methods now the add is where you add a single item okay now obviously we didn't read out of a database yet we're covering databases in the next chapter so they're coming very soon Let's go ahead and just show you that it does, in fact, load our items into the list box. So add adds a single item versus add range. Add range will accept a bunch of different overloads. Let's get a look at those overloads. So there's, well, actually just two overloads. Um, object collection value or an array. You see this is an object array. Keep in mind, inheritance is important. Uh, you can take anything and cast it into an object, right? That's called upcasting. And so if, if you cast an array of integers into object, that, that would be fine. You could cast an array of strings into object. And so we could come up here and say, okay, we got a string array values equals basically any array you could pass into this. Right? And, and that works just as, as well, just to show you that this is you know, this is in fact working and I'm not just making this up now. So so add is a singular item. Add range will accept an array. We're definitely going to use the add range in, uh, in some labs. So I wanted to demonstrate that. Some other methods of our items collection. Uh, if you want to insert something into a position, like say, oh, I want, you know, I've got 50 items in my list and I want to say, okay, an item in index number 25, put this thing. You could, you could specify the location where specifically to in insert it. 
you say, oh, I don't like item number 30, so remove uh, remove at index 30. Or if you say, well, I really don't like uh, the object Superman. You know, we got these uh, uh, superheroes uh, objects, and and uh, I'm going to remove that particular item. So we'll go through the whole list, find that Superman object, and get rid of it. And then clear uh, does what you would probably guess, is it just wipes it all and you know, gets rid of all the items. Okay, so it's really common uh, to work with uh, lists and combo boxes, and so we're going to use this items collection a lot. So it's good to be familiar with these different methods. It's a good thing. We've worked with collections before. We've worked with lists, and these methods uh, work the same way with a list as they do with these controls. So that's all good. Um, right, so so really um, just some different chunks of code there to to individually add each month in one at a time. You could just use add range and that would work a little bit easier than using a for each loop to iterate through an array of months uh, like I demonstrated a little bit ago. Um, same, it's what they're showing here on this previous slide is working with combo boxes. Uh, but notice I did not work with a combo box. I worked with my list, but they both have the items collection. That's again, that's inheritance. That's inheritance at work. That that these controls inherit from the same parent, so they have the same items collection and work very similarly. Okay, and so if we're looking at here, um, this is a way to just add some years into a, a list box, and so. Um, Really what's happening is you say, okay, th this year is 2020, and this is going to add the year uh, 2020 while the year is less than the end year. The end year would be 2028, so this would add 2020 through 2027 in our combo boxes, right? So we just got a little while loop that's um, going to iterate through and add those items. Um, on this example, the only thing that's really new is the selected index. And so by default, you could select a certain index. And so maybe um, notice by default, our list box doesn't have anything selected. But I'll say, OK, list example selected index equals 1. Now when the form loads, it's the second, in, you know, it's position one, which is uh, index one, right? The, the, the value of O-N-E is index zero. The value of two is index one. And so that's why, obviously, if I change this to zero, the default behavior would be to select the top one. This is really useful um, because, you know, you can, at any point in your code, you can select something uh, in the code. And if you change that to a negative number, at any point, maybe the user uh, selects a number or, or selects something and, and you want to deselect it, you change it to negative one. Um, and so it doesn't, that's kind of the default behavior. But the idea here is, okay, you know, the user makes a selection and you want to clear that selection. The way that you clear the selection is by setting the selected index to a negative, a negative one. I think you could, I think it works with any number, but I'd have to test it. But negative one should work. So all good stuff. Um, the only thing that I want to point out here, I'm going to highlight this chunk of code. You notice they're they're reading the selected item out of a combo box. And because a selected item, again, this is inheritance, the item is going to be an object, which is a generic class. And so if you're going to take the object and store it in any other kind of data type, when you use this selected item, you're, you're most likely going to need to cast it. And so that's what's happening here. We're taking this item, whatever it is, we just know it's an object, and we have to cast it into the appropriate data type. 
so that the data type on the left is an int and the data type on the right is an int. Otherwise, if we didn't have this, these parentheses with the word int in it, um, you'd have an int on the left and you'd have an object on the right. And that would be a compiler error. That would not work. Okay, unpause the recording. Um, so one thing that I, I, I explained I, when I paused the recording is that one thing that you got to remember is that the integer data type is an alias for an integer class in C Sharp. It's not that way in all languages, but in C Sharp, all your primitive data types, like ints, floats, doubles, chars, they all are essentially classes that when you create an integer, you instantiate the class and store value in it. And so because integer is a class, it could be upcasted into an object and stored as an object. And so essentially that's called, you know, that's called boxing. When you upcast a child class into one of a into a parent class that's called boxing or you know you're, you're you're boxing it up and then unboxing is the process of taking it out of the object and back into the data type of, of int and so that's why that works um, let's see so selected index that's just returning a number getting the text we'll just store it in a string uh, this works kind of similar in that we get the items at position one. Since items is a collection, um, we could say, okay, get the get the position one, convert it to a string, and store that in in, in a string. So these, this is a good slide because it shows examples of putting data into a list and getting things out of a combo box. So it shows kind of both both sides there. So slide nine is a good slide. Um, slide 10 here is just another code example of using the methods of the items collection. And so we've got the add method, we've got insert, remove at. Again, those collection methods are nothing new. So I, I would not anticipate um, you know, you're struggling too much with this because we've seen this before. Uh, when we're looking at our radio buttons, again, we've already kind of talked about that. We've got the default event, which is check changed. Keeping in mind that goes from true to false or false to true is when check changed event would run. And mainly what you're doing is you're checking to see if it's checked in your code. You say, okay, is the credit card radio button checked? Is that true? And... Um, you could do like they have here. I think this is nice and readable. When I when I code for people, you know, to see if the radio button dot checked double equals true, that's nice and explicitly saying, hey, look at this radio button. But you could just you could just delete this. Checked is a property that returns a Boolean value, true or false. And if this returns true, you would say if true you would call enable controls. Otherwise, you would call disable controls, right? So so the double equals true is good for readability for for beginners, but hey, now we understand a little bit more that we learned that that's not even necessary, right? So that's good. Let's see what else this slide has. Ah, uh, so this is a read. This is a way to read the checked value, but you can also change the checked value. Say, hey, this check button dot checked equals true or false. Obviously, Boolean value, those are the two things that you can assign to it. If you try and put anything else into that, obviously try and put the number. Um, some languages would allow a zero for false and a one for true. I believe C Sharp is one of those languages. So the zero or one should actually work, but anything else like a five or a ten or you know a string would not work. So the dot checked should ac accept a true or false. It should also accept a zero or a one. Every language is different, I believe. 
C sharp is one of the languages that does allow a zero or a one. Again, zero for false, one for true. Slide 13 is a tab order. We've been doing tab order for a long time. At this point in the class, I think everyone understands tab order and how it should work. Um, if you don't want something to have a tab order, keep in mind there's a property for that, you know, um, a tab stop, I believe it's called. And you can set the tab stop to false, and so things won't tab onto it. By default, labels uh, are not tabbed onto. Um, so, so if you don't want something to tab onto it, you could set the tab stop to false. You could disable the control. So by, by disabling the control, set the enabled property to false. And if you disable it, it's not going to tab onto it. Or if you hide it, those are, those are three different ways to, you know, let a control not be tabbed onto. And when you stop and look at the toolbox sometime, we've covered 10 controls, maybe, right? These are the most common controls. You're going to be just fine most of the time with these controls. You're really not going to need too frequently. Now, that's not to say you'll never need. These other controls exist because they're useful. But these are the common controls versus the lesser common controls. You know, mast text box, month calendar. Uh, you, you, some people have used that. Numeric up and down, picture box. We've used picture box. But these are just the common ones, right? If you start digging under here, a whole bunch of controls. And so we're not going to be able to cover all these controls in this class. There's, there's no way. But there is obviously the documentation um, that if you go to help, Let's see here. If you go to help, view help, should pop open a web page. The thing about uh, a, lib a library like C Sharp, right, a library of code, um, Every different library has different quality of documentation. You know, for example, I know last semester we all did um, jQuery. And I, my personal opinion, the jQuery documentation is really good. I really think jQuery. We also did Bootstrap. I also, my personal opinion, Bootstrap's documentation is pretty good. Visual Studios, uh, C Sharp, I should say, Documentation is really good. It's been around for about 20 years. Now, I just said those three things that we've covered, these are common languages that have been around a long time. The, the, the uh, documentation is pretty good. Uh, that's my opinion, but it does take some getting used to, right? And even in here, since the last time I've been here, this has changed. And so uh, just off of search, let's say, you know, um, if I'm following the book example, they picked on the date time picker control. So if I just do a date time picker, and so here they give you one, and this was a tutorial that uses a date time picker. Um, and so, point being, you can come in here, you can search the documentation. It requires a bit of patience and getting used to. But in general, Microsoft documentation is considered to be pretty good. Um, 
a question was just asked, and it is a good question. Say, hey, you know, I find it easier to just use Google uh, to find what I'm looking for. That's understandable and, and probably true for most people. Most people would have better results just by doing a Google search. The problem with a Google search is that you can't always trust the quality of code as I understand. So, so again, what the comment that was just made was, I found it easier to find uh, help on a control by using Google than by using the Microsoft documentation. And the point that I was trying to make is that sometimes the code that you find online, you know, there are good developers and there are people who aren't as good. And so I find the code that you find on the Microsoft documentation to be more reliable as far as the quality goes. And so when you're when you're searching online, you're just doing a Google search. You're going to get all sorts of of input, and um, the quality on the Microsoft documentation I find to be higher than the average quality that I find to be on Google. And so I I trust the Microsoft documentation more. So although it might be a little harder to get there and find and get used to, if you can find it through Microsoft, that's that's kind of your your tier, your tier one of, of quality. If you need to do a Google search, you know, the reliability kind of goes down. I okay. Um, I was not understanding the, 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 the statement that was being made, but I understand now the, the statement that was being made. What I said, I still believe to be true, uh, but the, the point that was being made was hey, uh, the date time picker control, you know, I didn't find this article necessarily on it. So just doing a Google search for the Microsoft documentation. So just coming on to Google and doing an MSDN, MSDN date time picker, C sharp, came to that article a little bit faster. I did not understand that that was what was being said, but now I understand that, and look, yeah, that's, that's correct. That worked faster for me, too, so that's a good point. Thank you. Let me give you some examples. Okay, so that's slide 15. Slide 16 here um, shows you how to, we're going to start working with multiple forms, and so as of this point, we have one form. You'll notice I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Program.cs tells us to run form one. If I want to rename, and I realize, I realize I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Let's just call this FRM. Hello world. We hit enter. Uh, do you want Visual Studio to rename everything called form one? Generally, you're going to say yes. Most of the time, you're going to say yes. Now in program.cs, you notice it renamed our form to form hello world. And so that's nice. And so let's add a new form to our project. Right click, add new item, or you can just come down here to form. You could either way, new item or form. Form, hello, we have hello world, then we have hello class. And on hello class, we're going to have just a big button that doesn't do anything right now. And if we want to change the default from hello world to hello class, we should be able to come right into the program.cs and change the startup object. Now, let's just test that that works. And now it starts hello class. So. What I did is I hopped into the program.cs. You do not want to rename this file. Um, you do not want to rename anything in here. You don't want to rename the main method. If I haven't said it before, it's a really important concept to understand that the main method is where the program starts. Actually, I know I said it before because we did command line applications. And I said, hey, 
this method right here, this main on line 15, this is the start line of your application. This is where code starts to run. The first executable line for your application is line 17. It says enable visual styles. Obviously that changes how your the look of your form. Uh, set compatible text rendering default. That's going to change the text and how the text looks on your form. right? And then it says, hey, call the run method. And the run method is going to create a new instance of the form called form hello class. And so this actually launches the GUI form hello class. And so that's what's going on there. The, the main method uh, calls these other methods on these three lines. This line right here instantiates a new object called form hello class. Form hello class is a partial class, but it's if, if you just ignore the word partial, it says public class form hello class inherits from form. We've covered all that before. We know we know what a class is. We know inheritance, um, and and the word partial just really means that we're not creating a form from scratch. Um, there's more code to this form. Um, behind the scenes that Visual Studio has created for us. And so that's how you create a new form. The If you wanted to add an existing form that you've created in another project, you could do that by adding an existing form. And what that does is it creates a copy. So let's say you've, you know, we keep doing the same labs over and over with different uh, programming uh, techniques. And so let's just say we're doing... Um, you know, the statistics, we've done statistics, you know, the high, the low, the average. We've done that so many times. And let's just say you want to import the form that you've already created. You can add an existing form and it would actually create a copy. So you would just browse to it on your computer, add the form, and it would copy it from where it was originally on your computer to the, to the new project that you're creating. And so um, when we rename a form, keep in mind that there's there's more places that it renames it. Not only do we rename it in the class, so like we renamed Hello World, right? And if you go into here, now there's form Hello World. But also, if you expand that, there is a C Sharp file here. that I believe oh there it is form hello world there there's again the rest of uh, the class it says partial class form hello world this there's the rest of the form that that's why it's called partial right part of it is stored in this file part of it is stored in this file right so if you were wondering well what do you mean partial here's part of the class form hello world here's the second part of the class form hello world and this is what's created automatically for us so by renaming a class here that's where you want to do it and when visual studio says do you want to rename everything you, you generally just want to say yes so it renames all those little pla uh, locations for you uh, notice it also if I go into my constructor. It renames my constructor for me as well. And if I create a load method, basically says, hey, when this form is loading, uh, it should rename that. Actually, I don't think it does, but I don't think it causes any problems. Um, button one dot text equals hello class. So when the form loads, it's going to change the text to say hello class instead of button one. Okay, so, so that works. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rename my form again. Hello class two. And I'm going to say yes. Now notice it changes my class here. It changes my 
class here, but it did not change my event handler name. My event handler name stayed the same. However, it still works. Okay, so you don't have to worry about um, the old name not matching the the event hand in the event handler. Um, we did learn obviously how to rename that here. And you could say form hello class two and if you were concerned about that, now that still works. So you don't really have to worry about those old handlers that still have the old names. Visual Studio is smart enough to make that work. So that's nice. Okay, we have two forms. Change the name of the form, we've done that. Change the event handlers events, we've done that. We've changed the startup form. Um, let's go ahead and we've been going for a little over an hour. I'm going to pause the recording. We're going to take a short break, give everyone a breather, and then I'm going to show everyone how to work with two forms, you know, one form calling another. So I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, uh, what we have next is how to launch another form as what's called a dialog box. And so uh, the code to do that, if I can jump ahead, is to create an object of the form and then say payment form, or the name of the object, show dialog. And so if we go back to my code demonstration, the form called hello class is running and I'm going to get it to launch hello world is the idea. So in the button click, I'll, I'm not streaming, I'm just recording. Sorry. Does that make sense, Troy? Create an instance of the form. Another form dot show dialog. There are multiple ways now to get multiple forms to run, right? But uh, the idea behind this dialog is that you have to interact with the one on top. They also call it a modal window, right? So you have to finish doing whatever you're going to do here. And then when you're done with it, you close it and it returns the focus back to the original form. So this is called a dialogue or um, a, a modal. And so that's the code. That's the only code that's really all that necessary. So it's not too hard to get another form to launch. Okay. Now there are some uh, properties to kind of change that second form. And so if you don't want to maximize it and you don't want the user to be able to minimize it, um, you can change some properties on that second form. So go back to the PowerPoint. The minimize and maximize box so we got to do this on the second one. So hello class was the first one. Hello world was the second one. Let's go to the properties. And it's the maximize box and the minimize box. You see there, they, they're no longer able to do that run and then you click the second one the maximize and minimize box are gone so you can't change the dimensions if you want to do that you can do that the form border style let's look at form border style
you can imagine my my wife just said, get the ketchup out of the fridge. It's right in front of your face. Just find, it's right there. Where? I can't find it. So the form border style indicates the appearance and behavior of the border and title bar on the form. There's a fixed dialog. And what that allows you to do, fixed dialog, uh, you can no longer uh, resize the window by dragging it. And so before I change that, you could resize the window by dragging the, the, the window borders there and so that changes that behavior so a couple a couple things that you could do to I guess not allow the user to mess with your window too much so moving on okay now we've worked with enumerations before and so um, we're gonna continue working with enumerations now what we're going to do is, okay, so you got the, the first window and you got the second window. And then the second window, you know, you can maybe do a little pop-up that will say, you know, yes, no, or cancel. And, and you could send that result back to the first form. And so if the user clicked yes, no, okay, cancel, ignore, all these different options, you can send that information back to the first form, and then depending on what the user clicked, you handle that differently. You say, if the user clicked yes, do this, else if the user clicked no, do that. And so that can be all stored in this dialog result, um, which is, is, is somewhat useful. I could see how that um, could be used. Uh, the tag property, though, I think is uh, could be very useful. And so what the tag property is, is a way to send information from the second form back to the first form, not just an OK, yes, no, or cancel, but you could send an object, you could send uh, a string, you could send an int, you can, you can send any information really that you want. And again, um, the tag property, if you re read the second sentence, uh, the tag property holds a reference to an object, which means it can hold any type of data. And so I, I wanted to do this because uh, I've used this um, in other ways, not using this tag property, but I've done this. But but this is interesting to me, so I wanted to demonstrate it, and I thought I thought maybe you guys could see how it would be used. Um, okay, so let's go, let me close all these down. We're not using it. So hello class is my first one. Hello world is my second form. Now, now this show dialog. I mentioned the dialog result enumeration. And so show dialog um, will return an enumeration of uh, those different options. And so we could say if result equals dialog result dot, and you get some different options. And so the way that we can return a, an OK value
let's put a button on here. Yep. No, that's that's all built in. That's correct. Uh, all these dialogue result options are just all built in enumerations. Let me go ahead and pause while I while I uh, reread a section of the chapter to demonstrate this real quick. Let me pause. Okay, I resumed. Uh, I'm just going to, there's a dialogue result property of a button. So let me see if I can find, let me do alphabetical order. Dialogue result. Okay, so if we click this button, the dialogue result for the form should be okay, and all I'm going to do is say this dot close. And so now when we close using that button, the dialog result should be okay. And what I'll do is a message box dot show. I'm just going to say it worked. So that in fact worked. Okay, so everything's working how we would expect it to. So uh, we set the, when you click the button, the button changes the dialogue result. And then you can test against that back on the, the first form and get it to say it worked. Else, let's see if we just throw an else message box dot show we'll just put some question marks there so let's see if we run this and we close it with the X we get the question marks so depending on how the user responded um, we get different output on this main form if they close it using the button it say it worked if they close it using the X it says it didn't work so now let's take some data maybe we want to take the value one two three or one, two, or three. I want to get rid of the hello world over there. So let's go to our second form. And do, 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 get rid of hello world. One, two, or three. And I want that value to be transmitted back to the first form. So whatever is in our list, whatever is selected in our list box, string... selected string equals list example dot items dot well, we'll do selected item and we need to convert that to string let's see if we can do Selected item cannot be used like a method, it's a property. There we go. And then, to string it, very good. Okay, so, so now we've read, I'm going to comment out the close, and just to show that this is working, I'll do a message box dot show, selected string, again, kind of building this out slowly. Hello class, we select two, click the button, it reports two in our message box. Okay, but we're still... Oh, interesting. It automatically did a close. I didn't even have to call for a close. It just did it. When you set the... When you set the dialog result, as I did, to OK, it automatically closed the dialog box. I'm going to do that again. I didn't have to close. And now it crashed. Let's try this one more time.
there we go. You had to make a selection. Otherwise, there was a null value, and that caused it to crash. And it closed it. Oh, great, 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 great. Okay, but instead of showing the message, instead of showing the selected string, I'm going to send it back to the first form. And I'm going to use the tag property to do that. And so the way to do that, this dot tag equals selected string. And so we got the tag property, and this keyword refers to this form. It refer refers to the current form. And then over here, I'll have a label. I'll call this label result. This is uh, this is pretty cool. Label result. And you click the button. When the dialog box comes back as OK instead of just saying it worked, we're going to read the tag property. Label result.text equals another form, which is the name of our second form, dot tag property to string. So we stored something in the tag property, and then here we're reading the tag property into a label. So we do something over here, and now we want to send this number three back to the first form and display it on the first form. So that's pretty awesome. Um, it can be the tag property can work with with more than strings though. For example, if we had a student class, let's make it a little bit more complex. Student So we've got a student class, and what we're going to do over here is have an array of students. Okay, so now we have an, ar a an array of students where there's only one student in it right now. And I'm going to add my class. Now, missing a semicolon. Okay, now you could see here the output is. Uh, is not really giving us anything useful. It's just saying, hey, there's a student class. What did you what we need to do to make uh, to make the list print out a student uh, maybe name, I'll say we gotta make a two string. Public override to string. And maybe we'll just return uh, the student ID in the to string uh, return student ID dot to string so now you get the whatever you put in that to string is what is going to be displayed in the list and so if I wanted the student ID and their last name I could do
So again, whatever you whatever you put in that two string is what is going to be displayed in the box. And so now we have a student class. We're loading our students into the list. Let's add a, two more students. Bring that over so that you can see it. How do you spell Sammy Hagar? Hagar. I don't even know. H A. It's a guess. Okay, an array of students. Sure. Okay, now we add the class uh, to the list. All right, we get our items over here. So now let's student selected student. Equals selected item. You do not have to now, what we need to do here is to cast this into a student. Like just before, we had to we had to convert it to a string. We're converting this into a student. Selected student. Okay, so now we're putting the student object into the tag. And let's go here. Put the student into the tag property. And now over here, we would set the tag. Now, it's going to return a student. So we, we need to consider this is going to be the student's to string. Actually, this might work without changing it. So if we say Bolton, there it goes. Because the tag returned a student, the student has a two string, and then you can put the student's two string into the label result. Now, obviously, we we could do student choice equals the tag. We're going to have to convert the tag into a student. Keep in mind, when it goes into the tag, it goes as an object. So it's upcast into an object. And then uh, label result.txt equals uh, choice dot. And it's a student object now. So we could say, okay, first name plus choice dot last name. And we can return the whole student object. So this is pretty cool stuff. I, I really like this. So Bolton, and then we get back Michael Bolton on the return. So you can see it does return if you if you really want the, the student ID and then the student ID. Very cool stuff. Awesome. Okay. Someone told me how to spell Sammy Hagar. It's just H A G A R. Now I must fix it. Bouncing all around. Where is. <laughs> Come on, man. There we go. There it is. Okay, so 
So we've used dialog result, that's cool. We've used tag, that's cool. Tag, very useful stuff. There is a, let's see, just read that second bullet, and uh, let's see, it seemed like, if you were to instantiate, instead of setting the property like we did, you could do a little message box pop up, which is probably what's coming next in the PowerPoint. Um, more uh, more ways to work with a message box. And so you could see that the show method of a message box uh, takes some overloads. And what I mean by that is there's multiple ways to code the show message. And so the first one is what you see in the in the message box. And then you see the caption, which is it's kind of like the title. The buttons takes an enumeration. And so you could have different buttons on your message box. You could have like a warning icon and all these kinds of like question marks, like these built-in little icons. Um, and then you could have a default button, which is a yes, no, cancel, which one, if they hit enter key, which one's the default. And so here they show um, a dialog result, which is an enumeration, um, which would return yes. The question mark is this little icon right here. Are you sure you want to save the data is what pops up in the message. The word payments was up here on the title bar. Uh, the default button is button two. Button one is yes, button two is no. So these little pop-up boxes, you, you know, we've worked with them, but there's, if you work with the overload, then um, you can get a lot of different options as far as what, what does this thing say and what does it look like and what are the buttons that it has um, kind of customize that a little bit there. And then you can say, okay, if the button that was clicked, notice we're, we're saving this in a variable called button. So dialog result button. Button is going to store an enumeration. And they can click either yes or no. And here you can say, if they clicked yes, if button double equals yes, then, you know, run this code. So we kind of uh, demonstrated that a little bit. Last slide, kind of came to this already. Um, last slide here is when the user goes to close a form, uh, a very common task that you want to make sure happens, like let's say they want to close this. Well, um, let's look at the form events. Form, and go to the events of the form. And there's a bunch of different events here. But one that could be used is this form closing event. Uh, very similar to form closed. Right, form closing versus form closed. Form closing is just before it closes. Form closed is just after it closes. So you can run code at both of those times. You could say, okay, before this form closes, you know, run code inside this event called form closing. Form closes, like, okay, this just closed. Now what do we want to do? So a common thing that you might put inside of form closing is, uh, you know, did you save your data. I mean, think of all the applications. They always ask you that question. You're in type Microsoft Word, you're typing your English paper, and you click the X bar up at the top and it says form closing. Right before this closes, you ask the user, did you save your data? Message box, message box dot show. Did you save, you save your data? Or do you want to save your data? You know, and then Um, and then we could say, okay, this is the title called save. Let me go back to the overload here. Uh, third one is the message box buttons, yes, no. message box 
icon dot you got all these options all these different little logos you could throw in there logos I mean icons and then the default will be no which is message box So the question that was just asked is, when I look at the pop-up, it's uh, IntelliSet, yeah, you can kind of see here, IntelliCode suggestion based on the context. It's trying to assume what you're going to want to use. Just trying to look at what you got and trying to assume what you might code. So let's see, when we go to close it, did you save your data? Yes, no, so on and so forth. Now, the other part of that, right, is this E dot cancel. You can see what, you, you might look at this and say, what is E dot cancel? This is a big, this is a big part of using um, this form closing event. So form closing has two parameters. And the first parameter is what is the control that initiated the form to close? So what is the control that is causing this event to start occurring? And in our case, it's either the button that we made or it's the button that's the X up in the corner. So that's what sender is. Sender is, is essentially going to be a button control. And then form closing event args is our second parameter. And it's they gave it the identifier of E. And E is additional information about the event. And so when we see E down here, Every time you see E, this is, generically speaking, additional information about the form closing. Um, you know, the cancel property, when, when cancel is set to true, causes the form to close. I think I got that backwards. If E is set to true, if they hit cancel, E is set to true, which means don't close the form. I had that backwards. When E is set to true, E dot cancel is set to true, that means don't close the form. So you can see here, if they if the user clicks the dialog button of cancel, then you say, okay, instead of closing the form, cancel that. Right? You cancel, which makes sense, right? Cancel is true, so you cancel the form closing. And so that's just a little bit of uh, extra code that could, you know, help you to do something that's really common, which is ask the user, did they save their data? And here, if they were to click the cancel button, um, it would stop it. Also, if they click yes, we'll look at what, if the button is yes, um, they say, if the data is valid, then go ahead and save the data. And so that's just working with closing forms. All right, guys. So that's really the end of, uh, of the chapter of the information. The last several slides are just code demonstrations. I always recommend that you look through this and under understand the code that's being written. Um, you know, if you if you do this every step along the way, if you look at the book examples and understand the examples in the book, that is ultimately going to help your comprehension of what's going on. Um, so I'm not going to step you through all of this because we do our own labs. But I do recommend looking at it and trying to understand what's going on. Okay. Now, 
I'm going to transition this into um, the first lap. Now, does anyone have any questions other than what's already been asked before I transition into labs? I can pause the recording. We can go through anything that I've covered. Let me start pulling up the labs. Again, you don't have to do, for my current class, you don't have to do the build a lab on lab nine because I have you working on the project proposals. <coughs> So today we're going to do lab one. Which is a superhero database. We're going to do this in class. And so I will close example one. Close all documents. Save it. kind of start with the controls, um, read through this program, must contain information about five superheroes, dropdown must be populated programmatically, dropdown must contain an option to select no superhero, when the user selects an option from the dropdown, display all available information about that superhero, create a superhero class that contains all the information about a single superhero. So the information you can see for the class is all very visible on the form. There's going to be an image, there's going to be a name, there's going to be a likes, a dislikes, a superpower, and a biography property, as well as a uh, URL for more information. And so I'm going to start with that superhero class, and then what I'm going to do is create the form after that. And so to start with the superhero class, and so again, kind of going back and forth, I can pull my requirements over to another screen. Look at those over there. One second here. So if I'm looking at the requirements, I'm going to make my fields. And I don't know that I can't just make these um, auto-implemented properties. Let's keep it. Superhero has a name. He has, he or she has likes. Dislikes. They have a power, superpower. You guys are welcome to uh, code along if you just want to watch for now and then code later. That is also just fine. Um, why do we need a set? Well, keep in mind, I mean, when you create these auto-implemented properties, uh, they create the instance field for you. And so we're going to use the set block to set the instance fields that are auto-generated. Now, the image type is not recognized, so I'm going to need to add a using statement. So 
So Visual Studio is pretty smart and it says, hey, what is this? Let's see if I can find it. Oh, I can find it. It's inside this namespace, system.drawing. So let's add a using system.drawing and now it recognizes the image type. And we're going to have a string for the URL. So try and keep this shorthand. I think I can get away with this. Yep. Okay, so now next we can create the form. And the form's going to have a drop down list or a combo box. I don't want the user to type into that. So we're going to change the property. Drop down style. Hey, it found it a little bit faster that time. Just a drop down list. Add in a label for likes. Dislikes. Superpower. and biography. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, let's add in a label for the name. make, just based on the mock-up, make the name a little bit bigger, and make the biography word a little bit bigger, make it bold maybe. Drag this down a little bit. Okay. Next thing we need is a picture box. Let's add a picture box. I will put this on my repository, so if you want the images that I use, um, you'll just have to do a pull on my repository and get access to that. Let me. show you the images that I'm using. Right now, on my computer, I'm doing this inside of C repos on the default location. C users reap. I think I'm admin and then source repos, chapter 10, again, I'm going to move this uh, into my repository, chapter 10 demo, and I paste in, in some images. And so to get these images into my uh, resources, we can do that by choosing an image. So we've got this properties resources. We've done this before, so we've got to browse to that directory, users, admin, source repos, chapter 10, images, select all these images, okay, so 
so that'll actually load them into my resources for me to use them uh, in code. And so we've created the form, we've created the class. Now we can start to code the form. And what I'm going to do there is let's get you know what I'm just thinking we're gonna need to add a two string here on my superhero class we'll come back to that in just a minute um, let's go ahead and create an array of superheroes superhero array called heroes equals new superhero and I'll just create it did say that the first one should be empty and null um, so I'm just going to create a new superhero with basically a bunch of emptiness So notice I'm not using the constructor. I did not create a param. I, I'm using the default or empty constructor, and then I'm using the properties to put the data in. This is called a object initializer, right? When you use the properties instead of the constructor to put data into the fields. Okay. Um, generally speaking, um, when you have a constructor you can use a constructor to do one of the two either a constructor should be default which is empty or the constructor should have all the fields so generally speaking I haven't mentioned that before but that's just a good practice that you know because you could create a thousand overloaded constructors and and that generally isn't a good thing um, ideally you want to an empty constructor and then you use the properties the object initializers or you have a constructor that initializes all your fields and so what else do we got in here we got the biography now I'm gonna add the name as I'm gonna make the name say none You want to set the image equal to null. Uh, what else do we got here? Superpower is empty. Telesense is pretty smart. Okay, so that's our empty superhero. Let's add a comma. Let's copy that and paste. And I'll just add Iron Man. We'll just set his likes to flying. Set his dislikes. We're just making this up. He dislikes to die. He doesn't want to die. Um, if I go to Wikipedia, I guess I can look up Iron Man on Wikipedia. You guys will have to do this for each superhero. There needs to be five of them. There we go. So that's his biography. I can make this a little bit more uh, friendly for viewers. Let's 
His superpower is money and smarts. The image, you go properties dot resources dot Iron Man. And the URL is going to be the Wikipedia page. Okay, so that's adding Iron Man. And then you could add more superheroes behind that. Um, when the form loads, We're going to call this Combo CBO Heroes. CBO Heroes Items Collection Add Range. We're adding the Heroes Array. And keep in mind that we want the name to display for each superhero. And so the way to do that is by coding the two string. So now the text box or the combo box should display the person's name. Let's see if that works. Okay, it does work. Uh, you could see that the selected index, I'm going to select, select the index to be zero. CBO heroes, selected index is zero. Give me just a second. Okay, so now we need to make an event for the selected index changed because it's going to say none by default. When we select Iron Man, we need to load Iron Man's information into all the uh, controls. And so let's do that. Selected index changed. Now, if the selected index is zero, you know, we're going to say, please select hero. Otherwise, Say label hero name, label name dot text equals we have our heroes array. Heroes sub selected index. Let's do this. Let's make a variable. Int way we could just use current index we don't have to type it over and over and over we don't have to type in the selected index over and over and over so we're using the array dot name and then here we'll say label name dot text is ok 
And all I want it to do right now is if we select zero, it'll say, please select a hero. Otherwise, it'll say Iron Man, if this is working. Okay, please select a hero. Gotta make that different. Okay, so that's working. Minus my label runs out of space. So let's give it just a little bit more room. Okay, please select the hero. It says Iron Man. And at that point, the rest of this is just output. We got the likes. Uh, you know what I didn't do? Make all the labels. Da, 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 da. Label likes. Copy that, paste it. Copy. This is, there we go. Copy, paste. Drag and drop. Label dislikes. I know you guys do that all the time. It's not just you. Me too. Gotcha. Label superpower. Label bio. Likes. Uh, current index. Dislikes. Label bio. And then we got a, a picture, which of course is, uh, we got to give this picture box, just say PB Hero. What am I forgetting? We got the image. We got the, ah, we need a link for the URL. One way to do that, let me look at the mock-up again. The link is below the biography. We'll just call this label link. And think about the Is there a link label? There is a link label. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna make this a regular label. I'm gonna make this a link label. There we go. There we go. Label link dot text equals.
Now just setting the text, I don't know if that's going to actually make it a clickable link. There might, ne might need to be more to that, but let's, let's launch it, see what's broke. Okay, we don't have a superpower. And the image is not showing up. So the superpower is easy. And code it. Let me look, let's see, Thor, Iron Man, Hulk, I'm wondering if it's showing up, I just need to set a property here. I'm going to set the size mode to zoom, that might have been might have been a huge image and then basically transparent background so it didn't look like anything was showing up. Close it. Rerun it. There it goes. Okay. So... A couple new things in this lab. Obviously working again with pictures. Working with combo boxes which we haven't done before uh, continuing to practice and learn about classes and how they all play nice together as well as uh, just some some code that we haven't uh, done before with these combo boxes using this selected index so um, you know what's remaining on this lab obviously is adding uh, I think the lab says five superheroes so you'll just add more heroes to the array that will automatically add those heroes to the list and then you'll have to well that should actually work there really shouldn't be too much more to it all right so that's a long recording i'm going to stop the recording here and i'm going to be available for questions for the next hour and a half for you guys so uh, let me go ahead and stop